Sly Collection Sucker Punch 3D. In 2002, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoons was released for the PS2. I myself didn't pick it up until late 2003, when my dad and I found it on a clearance rack for 20 bucks. In early 2004, Sly 2 Band of Thieves was released, but I never picked it up since I thought the first game was an overall letdown. Don't get me wrong, it's an okay game, but it left some major improvements to be had. Little did I know, there was to be another sequel on the way, Sly 3, Honor Among Thieves. Hmm. It makes me wonder where Uncharted 2 got its subtitle. Now it's 2011, and the Sly Collection has been around for a few months. Here's what I think of the games. Since all three of the games in the series were released, I'll have to look back into all of the games. I may think this game is lacking in some departments, but the story is pretty good. It follows, you guessed it, Sly Cooper as an adult. The game opens up with the three main characters, Sly, Bentley, and Murray. It turns out that Sly wants to get the book full of documents back from the Fiendish Five, a group of evil villains who took the Thievius Raccoons for their own good. But guess what? There's a cop after Sly with a seemingly odd accent. Plenty of time for that once you're safely behind bars. Yep, one of the protagonists of the game is Carmelita Fox, an inspector who always ends up trying to track Sly down. Sly escapes with what I'm guessing is a good maneuver and gets in the getaway van with the van and crew. Seriously, look at Carmelita. She's just standing there. Along the way, Sly wants to defeat the Venus Five and recover the Thievius Raccoons with the help of his best friends. Each of the four main characters are very much cartoony and have a bubbly sense of humor. Bentley talks too much, Sly's the cocky son of a bitch who always thinks he can get away with everything, and Murray's always scared of everything and looks at like Barney the Dinosaur. Carmelita is barely in the game unless you include her chase scenes and the short cutscenes you get at the end of each world. After defeating four of the Fiendish Five, Sly finds out that the parts to cover from Thievius Raccoonus so far have a silhouette of some kind of bird in the background from the pictures of Sly's ancestors. He then starts to wonder if it's the final member of the Fiendish Five, Clockwork. After working their way up to the base, Sly then begins to take on Clockwork. He then reveals that he used all his armor to live hundreds of years so that he could take out the Cooper gang once and for all. Why, the story never explains it. But what I do know is that I hate Clockwork's boss! With the help of Carmelita, Sly opens up a can of whoop ass and Clockwork falls into the lava. The last cutscene is delivered and the game ends. For a 10 year old game, the story was great. But even if the characters had a bubbly personality, did that give the game any cool traits? Well, not really. So with a good story, does it help the game's gameplay? Yes and no. For one thing, the whole game is played in levels. At the start of a new area, you run through and get to the end, then boosting you into the main hub where you can enter these holographic markers, thus taking you to the level. And you know what that means? That's right, you have to complete all of the missions just to progress. I don't hate these worlds, but I just don't like the way all the levels are laid out. For one thing, it doesn't exactly feel like Sly is built to be in this type of environment. Well, that's just my opinion. Alone, Sly can jump and sneak around by pressing the circle button around these blue auras. The name of the game is Stuff, and you'll have to use a lot of it just to survive. The square button is to slash, which will take down any foe in one hit or two hits, except for bosses. But the biggest pain in the ass is that Sly can only get hit once. Uh, well, if you pick up a Lucky Charm, of course. Just like the Mushroom and Mario Brothers, grabbing Lucky Charms will give you an extra hit before you die. By collecting two of them, the charm will turn gold and allow you to get hit a total of three times before dying. Now, because it's so easy to die, then there are also life systems implemented in the game. Along the way, you can also grab coins, which will either give you an extra life or another Lucky Charm. Scattered throughout almost every single level are bottles. By getting all of them, you can access the vault at the end of the stage. Getting all of the bottles and opening the vaults are pretty much essential for 100%ing the game. There are several types of levels in the game. You've got your normal slime missions, your shooting missions, and driving missions. This was made to keep the game from getting stale, and most of the time it does a pretty good job. But this begs the question, why aren't the other members of the gang playable? I mean, sure, Bentley has one section in the whole game where you can control his video game character, but that's it. And Mary has driving sessions, but other than that, it's the closest you'll get. Either way, the slash sections are okay, but sometimes this game can be downright frustrating. I'm talking mainly about the bosses. First boss, Riley the Frog, and he's pissy. Then there's Mugshot. Now, this is where the difficulty starts to rise to hot temperatures. Either me and the bros weren't being careful enough, or this boss is really that annoying. But where I feel the difficulty is raised to the highest is with this Ruby. Her boss consists with nothing but rhythm-based reflexes. Now, I wouldn't have a problem with that if the controls responded. And remember where I said Sly can only take a couple of hits before he dies? Well, guess what happens whenever you miss a button press with this challenge? You take a hit. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare to lose a lot of lives on this boss. Now, this next boss is a frustrating, just piss easy. But that makes me wonder why he wasn't put before Mugshot and Miss Ruby. 
I'm talking about none other than the Panda King. All I can say is have yourself a merry Slashmas. But the hardest boss has to be Clockwork. He has several different sections, and most of them are really easy. But one I can't stand at all is the second one. I swear to God, these have to be the hardest projectiles to dodge in any Sly game. As you're facing Clockwork, he you starts shooting these ring-shaped projectiles. The only option is to go through them, but I swear to God, Sly is way too big to fit through these damn things! The Verdict. This being the first installment of the Sly franchise, I have to say, isn't one of the best. Yeah, it makes a lot of its own rules in terms of level design and platforming, but I don't exactly classify this as one of the better games in the series, just because of that. Now, I do like this game, but it really gets me frustrated sometimes. To me, this game lacks more than brings more. I'll give it a 6.5 out of 10. So after the first Sly game, I passed the sequel up to play other games, because if there was a second one, how much better could it be? No one game! I'm tired of you bash crabbing on the series so far. R Brian? Will you please leave my channel alone? That's not important. What is important is you playing Sly 2. Sly 2 takes wow. place almost exactly after Sly 1. The game opens up with Sly and the gang trying to find the clockwork. Wait, the gang's all here? Play! So Sly and the gang are looking for the missing clockwork pieces because apparently beating him once wasn't enough. Everything goes according to plan until Carmelita Fox and her assistant, Constable Neela, show up and try to bust Sly. You then find out all of the pieces of clockwork are scattered around the world and are with a bunch of crime lords. Sly gets away and the first bit of the story begins. After finding almost all of the clockwork pieces, Sly, Bentley, and Mary get dragged into the northern battery and shipped up to the last enemy in the game. You then find out that Constable Neela used the Cooper gang to get all the clockwork parts together for her. She then merges with all the pieces and becomes Clockwork, the final boss in the game. Once again, with the help of Carmelita, you open up a jar of butt spank and hand Clockwork's ass to her on a silver platter. She crashes to the ground, and the gang pumps her full of bombs. That's when Bentley gets crushed and paralyzed by the mouth of Clockwork. Sly is captured by Carmelita, and Bentley and Mary leave with little hope. Sly and Carmelita talk for a little bit, and Sly, being the sneaky ass that he is, tricks her and he gets away. That's when the game ends. So what do you think of the story compared to the last game? I like the story a lot better. I feel that after playing the first game, you get a better understanding of the characters. Also, the game is told in a better way because of some of the personality swaps. Agreed. Sly hasn't changed, but the rest of the gang has. Carmelita, now with a new voice actress, is a bit more understandable. You feel bad for her sometimes, and it doesn't just seem like she's only out to get Sly. She's not the only one who gets a change, though. The most notable change has to be Mary. Remember how I said he was a puss bot in the last game? Not anymore. He now calls himself The Merry, and is now a bit more badass. I still don't think Sly 1 was heavy on great gameplay, but all of that changes in Sly 2. Instead of Sly just being able to do basic platforming, he now comes with a lot of new moves at the start. Pressing circle wall around blue auras still gives you the ability of stealth, and you can still double jump, but the most dramatic change was the camera. Unlike the last game where you could only move the camera left and right, Sly 2 has a camera that moves at full 360. This makes seeing your enemies a lot easier. Another addition to his moveset is his stealth moves. Pressing triangle while behind an enemy allows you to slam attack them. Wow. Actual stealth. In addition, you can pickpocket enemies to get extra coins. The coins no longer act as a life system, they now actually work as currency. What do you do with the coins? You spend them on character upgrades. Though I didn't buy a lot of them, I would only recommend buying the ones that will get you a trophy. By pressing R1, you can break into a run, which will alert nearby guards, but makes traversing around the hub world less tedious. Newly added to the game is the whole Cooper gang in its entirety. Yep, that's right, you can now play as Bentley and Murray whenever you want, or at least when the mission calls for it. Murray plays as the brawn of the game. You can't climb a pickpocket. These additions may sound stupid, or at least the pickpocketing, but it makes way for a beat-em-up style of gameplay. Bentley is my least favorite character, but he still plays good. Like Mary, he can't climb or pit pocket. And unlike Mary, he can't put combos together to take enemies down easily. He does, however, have a knockout gun, which can stun enemies for a short period of time. By pressing the triangle button, you can also throw bombs, thus ending enemies on a satisfying note. The biggest change in the game are the levels, or lack thereof. Instead of running around a bland and pointless hub world and then going to a level, the game is now played entirely in eight different hubs. And to that I say, it's about time. Spread throughout these hub worlds are extras and goodies that you can use to get extra coins. To enter a mission in the game, just land on the colored marker that corresponds to the character you're playing as. But my favorite change has to be the health. You can now take multiple hits, and each and every character has their own life bar. But with the good comes the bad. I'm gonna say this right now, guys, but this game is piss easy. In fact, there were honestly only a couple missions I legit got stuck on. Sure, this isn't as frustrating as the first game, but there really isn't any fair challenge here. 
That's just my opinion. I breezed right through this game. So overall, Slide 2 has to be our favorite in the series. We give it an 8.5 out of 10. It left more to be had, and we couldn't wait for Slide 3. If only it was any better. How about you take the story for this one, Ryan? No way. Me? Really? This is crazy! This is the greatest Don't thing I've ever- Don't so the game begins with Sly sneaking into what looks like some heavily guarded mountain fortress with the help of Bentley and five other characters who they try to keep a secret from you, although Murray is obviously one of them. It turns out that this island contains a vault in which all Sly's ancestors hid all over their loot, and Sly has come to view his heritage. Unfortunately, the island has been taken over by the main villain of the game, Dr. M, who set up shop and is trying to break into the vault himself. The only problem is Sly's cane is the key to opening the vault. As he's about to open the vault, one of Dr. M's genetically mutated monsters grabs Sly and is about to devour him as Sly's light flashes before his eyes. Wait, so the rest of the game is told in flashbacks? Excuse me, Dave, but I believe I was explaining the plot. You're pushing it. So yes, the next five stages of the game are told in flashback, and describe Sly's attempt to recruit new members to the gang to help him on the Cooper Vault job. The first of which is Murray, who left the team after Bentley got injured and began training with a mystical guru. The next two recruits are new characters, Murray's powerful guru and Penelope, an aerial specialist who turns to Bentley's love interest towards the end of the game. The last two new members of the game are old enemies of Sly, the Panda King from the first game and Dimitri from the last. None of the recruits simply join, of course. That would be too easy. They make you go on long, elaborate, and sometimes ridiculous quests to prove yourself or to gain a favor. Locations vary from scenic Italy to, I'm not joking here, a pirate town. A pirate town? Are you serious? Dave, would you please stop interrupting me? I'm sorry, Dave! I promise I'll stop it! After recruiting Dimitri, the flashbacks end, and Sly continues to struggle with the giant monster holding him, stating that his only regret is that he never told Carmelita how he felt about her. So, how is Carmelita in this game? It's my duty to put you behind bars. That, and I enjoy making tough guys cry like the stupid babies they really are. Yeah, so the ridiculous sounding Carmelita miraculously shows up and saves Sly, but before Sly can manage to get into the vault, Dr. M shows up again. And again, and again. I swear, this guy refuses to die no matter how many times you fight him. But anyway, Sly manages to get into the vault, and I have to admit, the design is pretty awesome. Once in the main chamber, however, guess who shows up? That's right, Dr. M. After another battle with him, Carmelita shows up. Once Dr. M tries to shoot her, Sly jumps in front of the blast, getting knocked across the room. After Carmelita fights Dr. M for the last time, finally. She wants to save Sly because the whole chamber is collapsing. Sly appears to have amnesia, and Carmelita tells him that he's her partner, Constable Cooper. Bentley and the gang evacuate the island, and after watching Dr. M finally die in the collapse of the Cooper chamber, they all go their separate ways after it appears that Sly isn't going to return. Just when you think it's all over though, you see Bentley spying on Sly and Carmelita as they dance on the balcony. Just then, Sly turns around and winks at Bentley's binocchi com, hinting that he faked amnesia so he could give up his life of pride to be with Carmelita. Well, that's a... Pretty sappy way to end the game. Hey, can I take some of the gameplay? Dave, I took the story, so naturally I should take... I mean... Of course. So, for Sly and Murray, gameplay is basically the same as Sly 2. Murray can still take guards out in single punches, and Sly still relies on stealth attacks. Bentley, however, is different. Because the events of the second game left them in a wheelchair, the gameplay allows you to use different gadgets that involve the chair. There's this basic attack, which makes the wheels pop out, spin around, and hit guards. Using different gadgets, you can jump much higher and move faster than ever before, which is pretty useful and fun. You also get to play as all the new recruits to a degree, and I mean that literally, because you barely play as them at all. The viewer is probably the one play as the most, and the coolest new character you can play as. Due to his peaceful nature, he can't physically attack, but he can jump on guards and take over their minds, make them run around and attack each other. If you get caught by guards, you can confuse them by changing shape to fit in with the world around you. Next is Penelope. Not much to say here because you can only control her RC chopper and car and what are probably the most irritating levels of the game. Panicking is only playable twice, but he is bad ass. Not only can he kill any guard in one hit, but he can shoot fireworks from a cannon on his back to kill guards and objects around you. Dimitri is only playable in underwater levels, but the controls are awkward and hard to get used to, so thank god you only have to do this twice. Lastly, there's Carmelita, and her controls are awkward too. Her camera sucks, and all she can do is shoot her stupid blaster and jump high. So overall, Panicking and the Guru are the only new characters that are fun to play as. So, uh, what's your opinion of the game?
The game heavily drags for the entire first two stages, but starts picking up in the third, but by that time there are only a few stages left, which is really upsetting considering Sly 2 as a whole was a long and overall fun experience. The best stages have to be the third, which involves Sly taking part in an aerial dogfighting competition and, I'm gonna say it, the pirate stage is probably the best in the game. The atmosphere and layout are exotic, the story is intense, and the entire last half of the stage takes place in a pirate ship. This can be annoying, but can also be really fun. On the negative side, all the villains throughout the game are bland and uninteresting, which is disappointing because I love the villains in the last game. Dr. M is not a satisfying or frightening villain when compared to Clockwork, or even Clock Love, and I hated how he refused to die. The story also lacks. I like how they decided to add characters, but it got kind of old how every person needed you to complete some huge elaborate task. Couldn't anyone just say yes? Overall, the game is fun, but not as fun as Sly 2. Besides the new characters and Bentley's new wheelchair, the gameplay and layout is exactly the same as the last game, which is fine as I enjoy the design, but whereas Sly 2 was better in every way from Sly 1, this one didn't bring much new to the table. Overall, I give it a 7.5 out of 10. So overall, the Sly collection is a great deal. If you like spending 40 bucks, then I'd highly recommend it. So Dave, do you love the Sly series now? What are you talking about? I've always loved it. Wait, why is the movie playing?